thanks Kathy for the kind introduction. Uh, it's been great running workshops and presentations here. The only thing that has been strange is everyone's so excited and supportive and kind. So usually in a group there's always four or five people that really hate you. So I'm hoping they're here today. Uh, they usually sit right in the middle and around that row. So I'll be looking. Uh, there, okay, one's already there. Thanks for raising your hand. Thank you. Uh, you need some of those, right? So uh, today is a bit of, it's kind of workshoppy, but not so much because obviously we're in a, in a theater style. But I'll talk about futures in general and then ask you questions along the way. It's a bit of a, a two-hour journey, so I hope you enjoy it. Now, anytime you go on these journeys, I try to frame it less about prediction. When you talk futures, everyone either says, where's your crystal ball? And the first 30 years of my career, I used to get really cringed and get upset. And now I say, fine, it's in the other room, I'll bring it. Or they all go back to the Jetsons, right? It's like everyone has that core memory. They said, futures, where's my flying car? And they get really upset. Uh, I would prefer to see it as creating a learning city, going on a learning journey. And on that journey, it's how to get people engaged in the future. Again, as, as Kathy so eloquently said. So part of that engagement is, of course, if you just keep on talk, give, giving people data about warnings, world is ending, this is ending, most people just turn off. The other thing we found is you present data that contradicts how they see the world, most people actually don't like to live by science. Uh, they prefer to argue against it. They double down on their cultural view and in fact, no learning happens. In that situation, to get people comfortable, because a rapidly changing world invokes anxiety. To get them comfortable, we say, okay, is there one thing we can do together? In this city, in this country, if I'm working for a corporation, or in a, in a prime minister's office, what's one thing we can nationally do, or at the city level do? That reduces some of the anxiety. Uh, those of you who like Homer Simpson, I apologize, I didn't mean to insult anyone. So we try to do something that you can act on, what's called the actionable step. This works until you're in a situation where things are changing and there's multiple perspectives. If you look at this slide, look lady, you're the one who asked for a famous movie star with dark hair, strong nose, and deep set eyes. Now she's made a few assumptions there, right? Does, does anyone want to yell out just to get you already engaged, you know, what that assumption was? I know it's shy, you just met each other, probably sitting by someone you don't like. Uh, so is there some assumption she made there? It's going to be human. Yeah, humanness is big here. And it didn't turn out well for her. There's also this assumption science will deliver everything. That science can always deliver what it promises, what's called the hype cycle. Everyone gets, amused, gets totally enamored by new technology until it drops and it doesn't happen. So what we try to do, given the unknown, given diversity of views, is do what's called double loop learning. Instead of just, here's a project, let's plan for it, let's reflect, let's pull back. How do we deal with the unknown? Do we have the resources? Kathy's point that actually Geelong has dealt with the unknown historically is pretty powerful. If you have that resource where you've invented before, that's usually a good sign it can happen again. So the double loop learning is difficult for people whose story is Bob the Builder. Because Bob the Builder says, well, let's just act. And we're saying, no, let's think through what are the possibilities for Geelong, find our story, then act. So we always base that double loop based on the narrative. The narrative is that core story, that metaphor that informs us. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. So this suggests that you know, we're not just looking at the future objectively. Everyone's involved. This is not saying people from Geelong are rhinos. That's not the takeaway. <laughs> the takeaway is as we see the future, we're complicit in it. So it's getting clear about how do I see the future? What are my biases? It's actually doing that mindful futures creation. Now when you don't do that, you end up with assumptions that aren't yours. You end up with futures that aren't yours. When we were working on Brisbane 2026, one of the newspapers did its article on what the future might look like. So if you look at that, putting on your critical edge hat, what's called the black hat in De Bono's work, what's actually missing there? Anyone? And again, just 
Yeah, people. Who needs them in the future, hey? <laughs> we got nice buildings, right? Uh, that, that's kind of the Bob the Builder world. And I love engineers. No, I was about to say some of my best friends are engineers, but that's not true. Uh, I still love engineers, but this is the notion is let's just build it instead of getting clear on the vision first. Now here's this first same imagination by a young 11 year old. Now different assumptions there, right? One, she's in the picture. She's a co-creator, not outside watching. She's part of the polity. It's deep democracy. Two, she's built in nature and look at some of her designs. She has those skywalks, which, which really means quite clever. Instead of the Jetsons flying cars, it's people still walking. And those of you who like to go to Europe, the thing I love about Europe is, in terms of my step counter, I get 20 to 25,000 steps a day. I mean, I just love that. We're everywhere I can walk and I feel safe. So she's actually captured that quite well. So there's multiple perspectives. There's Bob the Builder, there's our 11-year-old Ashley, and of course none of us have the full truth here. So the deeper engagement is looking at the multiplicity and seeing can we come up with a shared vision or shared visions and using that to move forward. Ultimately here, we have to get somewhere, right? This is not just about watching the future. Uh, that's actually quite funny that you're not laughing, but it actually worries me. So <laughs> I'm worried you're the gang who's the, who's the artist who watches them. No. So he's watching and he's dropping, right? So we're here to intervene in ways that are productive, mindful, and purposeful. So the future thus set is an asset, something you can use wisely. Now the issue is, why don't we use, oh, well, let's go back. I'll come to that later, why don't we use it wisely? We'll answer that in a bit. But first I want to show how we discount the future. In the middle of it, we actually rarely can see it. So let me go back 120 years. This was in the mental, it was in a hospital for the mentally ill, the insane, in West Virginia. And these are the type of things that would get you to be labeled as mentally ill. If you had worms, if you had remorse, if you had sunstroke, well, that's kind of all of Australia now, things are looking bad. Uh, bad whiskey, vicious vices in early life, kick a horse. So this was, a med this, was the medic this was what a medical expert would say, this causes you to be sent to a hospital. So this was the norm then, this was the default setting. Now go back 40, 50 years, equally disturbing from my point of view. On the right side, stay fit and slim by taking amphetamines. So, don't. <laughs> I work, I work a lot with the AFP, and the two things they're worried about most in this country are crystal meth and alcohol. It's the two biggest forms of crime, disease, and pretty much everything bad. In it. So avoid those two as much as possible. On the left, so that's how you establish expertise. 40, 50 years ago, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Now if you present this in Dubai, they say none of our camels smoke, but that's not the point. <laughs> The whole idea, this was considered health, right? The norm. The norm starts to change. 10 years ago in Victoria, 34% practiced meditation and 77% believed it should be federally funded. Look at that shift. Sending people to the mentally ill asylum, smoke a lot, have crystal meth, and then actually become mindful. So you see this wave in terms of what counts as health. Whether you agree or disagree, suddenly this becomes the norm. Now partly it's what's called epistemic, meaning we change how we think, mindset. It's partly because the data is so solid. People live longer and hospital costs go down. So if you work with hospital directors, they say, well, whether or not I like meditation, I want my cost to go down. It's efficiency. In the US, of course, it's about money, $1 billion in sales in meditation apps. So that's a lot. So again, what counts is health shifts. Now, a few years ago, I started working with Esri, and they started to think about, well, let's forget about how you change yourself. How do we redesign for health? So they said the biggest shift in medicine will be geomedicine. So if you have children, and they say, well, I want to be a surgeon, you say, oh, that's kind of passe. A good robot can do that. How about you redesign cities based on health? 
So that's their big project, and Google is now entering this space too, what's called geomedicine, geohealth. You figure out in Geelong, here's the places where creativity is, here's where illness is, here's where et cetera is. That's a very different way of seeing the future. Then we start to move towards the world of apps, meaning real-time information about your own health. And again, the places that will lead will be mostly South Asia, Bangladesh, and possibly in Africa. We have high penetration. They've skipped the landline world and gone straight to mobile phones.